Welcome everybody. It's a pleasure to introduce Greg Menkio. And it's actually tough to introduce him because everybody knows every, everything about him. Everybody knows about his textbooks, his blog, his famous blogs, and his insightful tech, uh, economic papers. Perhaps I thought I should mention something about his connection to Princeton. Also, Greg was actually an undergraduate here at Princeton. And he took his principles in economics with Harvey Rosen, became his RA in the first summer. And then from then on, they continued to work together, latest in the Council of Economic Advisors, they worked together. So that's how the relationship grew. And Greg was also a very ambitious student. He was very advanced at the early stages. He took already the first year sequence in the PhD sequence in his junior year. So he was well ahead of uh, many others. And I was told that he still has a black and orange umbrella he carries around on the uh, campus at Harvard. That's, he still keeps the Princeton colors flying. And we're looking forward to his talk about monetary and fiscal policy, how things work together, and what promises need to be broken in order to keep everything sustainable. Thanks a lot and give an applause to Greg. Uh, thank you very much. It's, it's a delight to be uh, uh, back here at uh, Princeton. Um, there's a lot of things uh, to talk about in the, the macroeconomy right now. Uh, my, uh, uh, one of my colleagues at Harvard likes to say that being a macroeconomist uh, during a deep slump like we're experiencing right now is a little bit like an undertaker during a plague. Um, times are sad, but business is good. And uh, certainly for, for those of us who study the macroeconomy, we, we've been getting a lot of uh, phone calls from, from a variety of people trying to help them figure out what's going on. Not that we have all the answers, but maybe we can provide um, a little bit of insight. Uh, I noticed on the uh, flyer out there that in announcing this, it mentions that I am an economic advisor to uh, Mitt Romney. Uh, that, that is true. Um, if, you, if you saw the Bloomberg debate um, uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, they asked him, you know, what economists do you talk to and have influenced your thinking uh, over the years? The first person that uh, uh, mentioned was uh, Milton Friedman, one, certainly one of my favorite uh, economists, but of course Milton Friedman is now, now long gone. Uh, the second person he mentioned was myself, and then his very next sentence was, but of course, I don't agree with everything he says. <laughs> so I, 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 I point that out because I'm going to say some things that presumably Mitt Romney doesn't agree with. And so you, even though I'm an advisor to Mitt Romney, you shouldn't interpret anything I, I say as necessarily representing uh, his, his views. I, mean, I want to actually start off by talking about something I learned in the freshman philosophy course here. Uh, when I was um, a, fr a freshman here, I filled my distribution requirements. I, took a course from Richard Rorty, who, is, as you may know, is one of the great 20th century uh, philosophers. And uh, one of the books that he assigned us in that freshman philosophy course was The Myth of Sisyphus by Albert Camus. And uh, that, it, that book had a profound influence on me at the time, as when I was a student. And, I, and I've been thinking about it lately in, in, the, in the context of thinking about my role uh, as an economist and thinking about the history of my own field, macroeconomics, in business cycle theory. What well, Camus is about, the, the, basic, the fundamental issue, issue in Camus' book, The Myth of Sisyphus, is the question of how do you lead your life once you realize that your life has no meaning? So you can automatically see sort of the connection to economics. Um, and so what, what, what Camus uh, does is he tries to talk about how you give your life meaning by, by choosing a task that while it may be fruitless, is one that you're going to dedicate your life to nonetheless. And uh, the, the example he gives, the prototypical example, is Sisyphus, who you may recall is the character from Greek mythology. And Sisyphus was destined to spend eternity pushing a rock up a hill. And even though, and what was going to happen is he would keep pushing this rock up the hill, and as soon as it got to the top of the hill, the rock would immediately roll back down to the bottom of the hill. So Sisyphus would go back down and start pushing it right back up. And this would, this would go on, the cycle would go on uh, forever. Uh, and Camus had great respect for Sisyphus because he, was, he admired Sisyphus's desire to keep pushing that rock up the hill despite the fact that the task was fruitless. 
And thinking about the history of macroeconomics, that is the attempt to try to understand the ups and downs of the business cycle, a lot of the field that we have, that we've seen over the past century, has been a series of trying to push the rock up to the hill and understand what's going on in the economy, only to have our efforts dashed and have the rock roll right back down. So if I think about the history of the field, let me give you sort of a very brief, stylized history of, of, of my field. It basically starts pretty much in the 1930s when we had this tremendous economic downturn. Not the first uh, economic slump we've experienced, but certainly the deepest in history, the Great Depression. Unemployment reached 25%. Uh, the stock market fell to about 90% off its previous peak in the late 20s. Um, and you re recognize that that kind of economic downturn, far deeper than anything we've experienced recently, is, is one that calls into question you know, what, what's going on. Well, why do we explain, how do we explain this? And indeed, many of the 20th century's great macroeconomists, in their, if you read their biographies or autobiographies, what they'll tell you is that they started this field, they, they dedicated their lives to this field to try to understand this. How is it that economy looks so prosperous in one year and all of a sudden looks so poor? How is it that we can have all these people who have all these wants, but also can't find work to produce things that presumably, presumably satisfy their and other people's wants. So how could you have both these, all this, this, these great needs, but also these tremendous unemployed resources? That seems to be a deep puzzle uh, that many economists were wrestling with. Well, most famously, John Maynard Keynes wrestled with that question, and he wrote his famous book, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money, in the 1930s, published in 1936. And that became the beginning of macroeconomics uh, as a distinct uh, field. The Keynesian revolution was tremendously controversial. Uh, there were economists who thought it was completely ridiculous, but the younger generation of economists thought it showed some promise. And throughout uh, the immediate post-war era, the debate over Keynesian uh, economics uh, was, was one of the centerpieces of the economics profession, and certainly the centerpiece of the, the field of called macroeconomics. Eventually, the Keynesian view of the world did prevail, and the 1960s, it's fair to say that most economists studying this, not all, but most economists were Keynesians of some sort, not necessarily agreeing with everything that Keynes said, but had a worldview that was clearly influenced by the framework that John Maynard Keynes had put forth. People felt like they could use Keynesian economics to influence the economy. Most famously, uh, John Kennedy brought many famous uh, Keynesian economists of the day to the White House. They engineered the Kennedy tax cuts in order to get the economy going. It seemed to work. People felt like this was a great success for of Keynesian economics. Uh, and people were starting writing books with titles like, Is the Business Cycle Obsolete? There was actually a title of a real book at the time. The sense was that they had, we had sort of scoped out the debate. We didn't know, understand everything, but we got the basic framework of how to think about flu economic fluctuations and how to combat it. And therefore, we, we, you know, science, we had made great progress. Well, then in the late 1960s and 1970s, a variety of things happened. In the economy, we had a period of stagflation, of high unemployment and high inflation. And within academia, there was a backlash against Keynesian economics, led first by Milton Friedman and then by uh, Robert Lucas, and also including people like um, uh, Tom Sargent, who recently won the Nobel uh, Prize in economics. And all of a sudden, economics was in disarray again. So you can think of the Keynesian uh, revolution as taking this rock, finding it at the bottom of the hill, pushing it to the top, and all of a sudden they run into to Milton Friedman and Tom Sargent, and the, roll, the rock rolls back down again. Well, that's more or less when I entered the profession uh, of, of economics. And there was a, it, was a very, it was a very exciting time. The economy was doing terribly. It's always ex exciting for economists when the economy is doing terribly. There's all sorts of great questions. And so whenever the economy is doing terribly, you see a big influx of students into macroeconomics. So we saw it in the 1930s. And, in my, and, and with the generation of people like um, Milton Friedman and James Tobin, uh, and you see it uh, in, the, in the 1980s with economists like myself and many of my classmates entered, studying business cycle theory because the economy is doing so badly. Uh, I entered college in 1976. Um, and uh, you're seeing it today with the, with the economy doing really a lot of students are entering. So, it's, so, so my generation uh, entered, we started debating how to think about the econ economy. I participated in a uh, research program, sometimes referred to as New Keynesian Economics, that tried to incorporate some of the insights of Keynes, but also some of the insights of people like Milton Friedman and uh, Robert Lucas, to try to reach a new consensus. And over time, during the 1980s and 1990s, a consensus uh, did develop, 
something that's called the New Keynesian Consensus or the New Neoclassical Synthesis. And people thought they had a sense of how to think about uh, uh, the economy. Um, economists weren't being as, as, as divided among themselves about what the framework for thinking about the business cycle was. And the, the, they had a simple way of conducting monetary policy, something called the Taylor Rule, which some of you may have heard about in your, some of your economics classes. Many economists, many economies had developed had adopted something called inflation targeting, it's approximate target. And there was a sense that the, the, the framework that had been developed and the tools that had been developed had led to pretty good economic performance. The 1990s were a period of, of really of great economic tranquility. We had some recessions, but they were fairly mild. They were far, far apart. And people were writing about why is it that the economy become so stable. It's referred to as the great moderation. And there was a large literature on what caused the great moderation. Was it just good luck? Was it structural changes in the economy or more of a service economy, less of a manufacturing economy? Uh, what, but really, the, the explanation that we, we, we economists liked was, oh, we figured stuff out. We're smarter than we were. We've got stuff figured out. Great. Finally, the business cycle is obsolete. You didn't quite say that, but that was sort of the, 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 the theme behind the great moderation uh, literature. And then all of a sudden, we have the uh, current uh, re recession, sometimes referred to as the Great Slump or the Great Recession or, 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 the, or, or a mini depression, whatever you want to call it. We have something that's obviously quite severe, driven by problems in the financial system, um, and we are now uh, thrown, macroeconomics are now sort of going back to fundamentals, saying, okay, where, what, did we, what did we see that was wrong? Uh, what do we, how did we change our models? Uh, one of the things that a lot of people are doing is thinking about the role of fin financial institutions in macroeconomics, the, the canonical model that was used a few years ago in many central banks did not have a prominent role for financial institutions. In a fairly um, simplified financial sector, uh, and as a result, um, a lot of things that, that you need to think about to think about what's going on right now uh, were not uh, easy to think through using the, the models that were available just a few years ago. So that, that's basically where we are today. The rock has now rolled back down to the bottom of the hill. But uh, as Albert, Albert Kemu would recommend of us, we're going to be macroeconomists. Do not give up. Uh, we're, gonna, we're starting to push that rock, rock back up. And this, as I mentioned a moment ago, this is, it, economic downturn is generating a lot of interest among students. And I'm sure there will be uh, a lot of interesting research coming over the next few years. One of the places that leaves us right now thinking about economic policy is, is a very strong case for humility. That is, if you see, if you read any economist that says, I absolutely know what we should do, it's completely clear. Uh, I don't know why those idiots aren't doing exactly what I'm telling them to do, because it's so obvious this is what we should be doing. As soon as an economist see, seems, has that level of confidence in what he's saying, you should run the other way. Whatever he's saying, you should run the other way. Because any good economist now, given our state of knowledge, has to show tremendous humility. You can take your best guess, saying, this is kind of what I think. I think that's a mistake. I think this is a good thing to do. But you, you really can't be 100% confident. Uh, in, in your views, and so I, 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 I'm going to have I'm going to express a lot of opinions today. But let me make, make very clear that I'm saying them all with a with the air of humility, knowing there's lots we don't we don't know. So that's sort of the, the, the simple potted history of my field. Let me move on and talk about some of the current policy issues, which is actually my main uh, topic for today. I want to talk basically about monetary and fiscal policy, and fiscal policy. I want to talk about the short run fiscal policy and uh, long run fiscal policy. Uh, all of all and all of these topics are on the um, agenda uh, today. Okay, monetary policy. Well, if, if, you, t if you walked into a macroeconomics classroom just a few years ago, it's, it's pretty likely that then your macroeconomics professor would say, well, we kind of understand monetary policy. Monetary policy is the first tool we use to stabilize the economy. Uh, when the economy goes into recession, we know what to do. We just cut interest rates, and uh, we cut interest enough to get the economy back on track. And we had a, little, a rule called the Taylor Rule, which is a, a, a simple formula for saying how much you should adjust interest rates to changes in inflation and changes in unemployment. Uh, and, the, and that seemed to work pretty well, both as a description of what central banks were doing and as a uh, pre, uh, normative, prescriptive rule about what, what central banks should be doing. So it, it seemed to work pretty, pretty well, both as a positive and as a normative uh, theory. Well, if you take a typical Taylor Rule, and I'm using, I'm using one that I've used in some previous work, a version of the Taylor Rule. And you plug in where we are today and say, okay, what should the central bank do now, given where, we are, given where unemployment is, given where inflation is, what should, what, where should they set the interest rates? The answer is it should set it at roughly negative 4%. <laughs> so you can see they have not cut interest rates enough. They've cut interest rates all the way down to zero, 
but it's still way high compared to what this rule would propose. Now, let me think for a moment about, about that. They have, they, they've stopped cutting interest rates, and it's not because the, Ben Bernanke is looking and saying, okay, well, the kind of looks fine. I don't want to cut interest rates anymore. The kind of doesn't look very fine at all, but there's, there's good reasons that he can't cut interest rates below zero. But it's an academic, and, and you say that, people laugh when I said the negative 4%, but it's worth thinking about why is it that we can't cut interest rates to negative 4%. Um, why is the zero the lower bound that we face for interest rates? After all, mathematicians don't have problems with negative numbers. Why do central bankers? Well, it's pretty clear when you say, when you say that. You know, why, why, wouldn't, why can't we cut interest rates to negative 4%? Well, nobody's going to lend money at negative uh, 4%. Why is that? Well, you can always earn zero on just holding currency. Currency has, 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 earns a rate of return of zero. And if you're told, oh gosh, if you, you know, lend me $100 and I promise you a year from now I'll pay you back 96, the answer is, well, rather than doing that, I'll just put my money in my mattress or in my safe. Uh, and so nobody's going to lend money in negative um, 4, 4%. Now, normally we don't have to worry about zero lower bound. Normally interest rates are, um, are, are, are in positive regions. The fact that currency earns a zero rate of return means people are always happy to lend it out. And they only hold currency. What they need is for transactions purposes to go to Starbucks or you know, to, 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 to buy their groceries, that kind of thing. So you hold currency for transactions purposes, not really as a store of wealth. For a long-term store of wealth, you can earn a positive interest rate, so you do that. But if, also, if you try negative interest rates, all of a sudden currency would be a good store of wealth that people would start hoarding. And so you couldn't really get interest rates negative. Well, the, this, the, this, the, that line of thinking is, goes, has a long history in, in economics, and there have been economists who have thought about that. And there's a fact that an economist named Silvio Gessel. Anybody, raise your hand. Has anybody heard of the name Silvio Gessel? Oh, well, okay, one person here. See, see Silvio Gessel uh, is, is, is not particularly well known, but he actually has solved this problem for us. And Silvio Gessel um, had the following solution. He appreciated that people wouldn't, he couldn't make interest rates negative because currency earned a negative return. And so what we need to do, according to Silvio, was to make sure the currency also earns a negative return. And he, he had this idea of stamped money. And the idea of stamped money was you to, to keep your money currency valid, you have to bring it to the bank once a year and get it stamped, saying it's still valid. And to get it stamped, you have to pay a fee. Say 10 cents for every dollar. And so holding currency would have a return of negative 10% because you have to get stamped once a year to keep it valid. And once you had currency earning a return of negative 10%, well then you could certainly cut bond rates to negative 4%. These people would be happy to lend out their money and get 96 back a year from now. Because if they hold their money, $100 in, their, in the mattress, then they've got to pay $10 to keep it valid a year from now. So uh, you know, negative interest rates all of a sudden become possible if you have stamped currency rather than the kind of currency we have that earns a zero rate of return. Now, as, as we just established, Silvio Gessel is not a famous economist. <laughs> this idea did not go far. Um, but it did actually have some influence on some more famous economists. So my guess is more people in this room have heard of John Maynard Keynes. And John Maynard Keynes actually talked about Silvio Gessel's idea in the general theory and said kind of positive things about it. He said, you know, it's not a bad idea. It's kind of clever. Um, so, Economists kind of have thought about how you have money, you might get negative interest rates. I don't, I don't know of any major policymaker who has, who has picked up the flag of Silvio Gessel and, and tried to run with it. But it's, I, as, a, as a point of history of thought, it is an idea that has floated around. Now, the closest we've come lately to the idea of negative interest rates is an idea floated most famously, I think, by Olivier Blanchard, who's the chief economist of the IMF. But other, many other economists have pointed this out uh, as well, which is that if we had higher rates of inflation, we had, if the Fed targeted not a 2% inflation rate, but say a 4% inflation rate, then you can get real interest rates down even if nominal interest rates are stuck at zero. And so what Olivier and, and, and others have argued is that a higher target inflation might be a way to get real interest rates negative even if nominal rates stuck uh, at zero. Now, I wrote a column in the New York Times, I don't know if it might have been two years ago, exploring these ideas, talking about Silvio Gessel's idea, talking about um, Olivier Blanchard's idea. I wrote a monthly column for the New York Times. I've been doing it for about three or four years. And I wrote one talking about these issues, pretty much like I've been talking to you about today. Uh, and as soon as this column came out, uh, immediately Drew Faust, the president of Harvard University, started getting letters, angry letters, explaining how, how she should fire me for, uh, for, for proposing these ideas in the, in the, in the, in the New York Times. Now, Drew, Drew Faust, 
Knight um, very nicely wrote back to these, 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 these angry uh, New York Times readers, explaining that the Har Harvard is a fire faculty for writing crazy ideas and articles. Um, and if we did, we'd have no one teach the courses. Um, so uh, so I, my, my job is safe. But it was very interesting to me that in my four years of writing New York Times articles, overtaking some, um, what I think is, is, is not in some mainstream positions, uh, this is the only time where I got so many angry letters uh, in response to these ideas. And it makes it very clear, and the reason I, 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 raise, I bring that, that up is that, that explains to me why it is that, say, Ben Bernanke couldn't possibly ever go down this route. Ben Bernanke couldn't do what Olivia Blanchard suggested he did. Because I think if he did, if I got angry letters just writing a, a, a small column in the New York Times, just imagine what would happen if the, if the, central, if the head of the central bank decided to announce 4% uh, inflation going forward. I think it's just even if there's an economic case for it, it's clearly politically unpalatable. And uh, the one benefit of that would be that you, you guys would have Professor Bernanke back here under teaching your classes. But I don't think he could, if he could really survive as central bank chairman if he tried to uh, announce higher inflation uh, as, as, a t as a way of getting out of our current problems. Now, what he could do, and I think this idea has been floating around, but I think this has probably more practical merit is he could try to announce something like a, a, an inflation target or a nominal GDP target, and in particular announce a target for the level of prices or the level of nominal GDP, and promise that if we ever end up in a Japan-like deflationary situation, he's going to keep interest rates low until we get the price level or nominal GDP back on target. I think what's really concerning him and many economists the most is that the US is going down the Japan route of a prolonged slump very low inflation, perhaps even deflation, that sort of exacerbates the, the, the slump. And I think one possible way of, of dealing with that would be to announce a level, a, a, a price level target, I mean, say we're, we're in a state, prices are going to be rising by 2% per year, which is what they've been doing over the past 20 years. And if we get an undershooting, that is, if we get too low, inflation too low or deflation, we'll keep interest rates low until we get the price level back on path. And there'd be one way to, in that scenario, get a little more inflation expectations. Uh, and we're lowering real interest rates uh, without abandoning the commitment to, to a long run 2% uh, inflation rate. So I think that's an idea that has been floating around. Interestingly, the, uh, the idea of a nominal GDP target has recently been endorsed by some Goldman Sachs economists. And it's one thing that a bunch of airy fairy academics like me say these things, but when real world guys like people at Goldman Sachs say something, then it could be attraction. Uh, and um, so the fact that we're sort of seeing more, more uh, <coughs> More people, even people outside of academia endorse some of these ideas it means it might be more palatable for central bankers to actually um, uh, take it uh, seriously. Now, what we've been getting in, um, uh, in monetary policy is things like quantitative easing and, the, the, and Operation Twist. My guess is, that, my sense of those, those are small steps in the right direction of trying to stimulate the economy, and those are complementary the idea of announcing a price level target or a nominal GDP target. Those are sort of more short and tactical issues. Um, and I'm in the nominal GDP target or price level target would be more, more of a long run strategic change uh, in monetary policy. So let me sort of stop talking about monetary policy and then move on to fiscal policy where there's been a lot of action uh, going on in recent years. There's really two big questions of fiscal policy. First is, what can fiscal policy do to get the economy, in, get the, get the economy going? And, uh, and that's, I think, what can a fiscal policy do to prevent us from being Japan? Uh, and then the second question is, what can fiscal policy do to stop us from being Greece? And, those, and the problem is those are, two, th those are two important goals. I don't think we're going to end up like Japan or end up like Greece. Uh, but they often push in different directions. And that, that's why I think the current fiscal situation is so, is so difficult. Um, so let me sort of first start off about the short run fiscal policy, how are we going to prevent being like uh, Japan, and then I'm going to turn to the, the, the long run fiscal situation. OK, now, if you were a doctor, let me give you a, a sort of story. Let's imagine you're a doctor. And the patient comes in, and the patient's sick, pretty fully sick. But he doesn't have a set of symptoms that you exactly recognize. Looks familiar to stuff you've seen before, but not exactly what you've seen before. So you're not 100% sure how to treat him. What do you do? Well, what you'd really like to do is have 100 patients like him. And if you have some idea of what might work, say some proposed remedy, you'd say, OK, fine. You, I want to randomize. You go 50, get the, get the uh, medicine. You 50, get a placebo. Come back in a couple weeks, we'll see if you, the guys with the medicine did better. And if they did better, well, the, the thing worked. Okay? That, that is a controlled experiment. That is how you really find out whether some prescription drug works. 
And I, think, I don't think there's any disagreement among doctors that's really the right way to test these things. But imagine you're not a, a, a guy doing clinical trials, you're just a practitioner, and you have one patient coming in, and he says, I'm kind of sick doc, what can I do? You can't say, well, go find 99 people just like you so I can run my experiment. You sort of, what, what, what you have to do is you have to sort of take your best guess, even if you're not sure, come up, come up with a remedy that you think might work, and then see what happens. Well, only one patient. So you, so you take your best guess, you give him the, you give him the medicine, say, come back in a week or two, and we'll, we'll evaluate you then. He comes back in a week or two and he's sicker. Then what do you do? Do you say, gosh, I guess my medicine didn't work? Do you say, I guess the patient was sicker than I thought, I better up the dosage? Which of those two do you do? Well, fundamentally, you realize that is a very hard epistemological question because, in principle, either of those things could be right. I mean, it could be that your, your diagnosis was wrong, the medicine's making him worse, or not helping, or it could be that he was just sicker than you thought, he needs a bigger dosage, he needs to long, wait longer to get better. Either of those is possible. And the reason I bring up that scenario is that is pretty much the situation that the Obama administration finds itself in right now. They came in, there's no question the economy was very sick, they inherited a very difficult situation. Um, and what they said to us was, well, we know it's going to fix this, we want an economic stimulus, uh, about $800 billion stimulus, and they, they had put out a, a, um, a report, uh, even before actually he had taken office, written by his uh, advisors, um, and what the report uh, said was that, you know, if we don't do anything, if we just let things go their own course, unemployment's going to go up to 9%. But if we pass a stimulus, we can keep unemployment to, to max out at 8% and then start falling. Well, we actually got the stimulus and unemployment went to 10 percent and still hovering at nine, even if three years later. And, and what does the Obama administration say right now is saying, well, obviously we need to up the dosage. And that could be right. We don't actually, I remember I said we should need to be humble as economists. We don't know. Maybe that's right. Maybe the stimulus wasn't big enough. Maybe it did work. We just need to sort of up the dosage and, and do some more. And that is what they're arguing. Whereas the other point of view is maybe the diagnosis was wrong and the medicine was wrong. That's the, the fundamental issue we face, and uh, the very hard epistemological question of trying to figure out what's the right uh, answer. Now, the theory that the Obama administration used to evaluate their fiscal stimulus was not extraordinary. It was a very textbook Keynesian theory. It's the kind of stuff you can find in uh, all uh, textbooks. Uh, they say they took a standard ma macroeconometric model, uh, and they simulated it, um, and they came up with what are called fiscal policy multipliers. I know those who have taken Econ 101 have studied. And the fiscal policy multipliers were very standard. And they said, okay, with these fiscal policy multipliers, what will our stimulus do? Um, and then they constructed the stimulus based on using those multipliers. Now, so, the, so they used a very standard theory. I can't say they had some outlandish, crazy theory. It was a very conventional theory. But even though it was a conventional theory, that didn't tell you it's the right theory. And that's the question that economists have to ask themselves right now. Um, I teach, my main teaching assignment at Harvard is to teach the introductory economics course, what we call ec 10 or here you call Econ 100 and 101. Uh, it's a sort of full year course at Harvard, uh, micro in the fall, macro in the spring. And I organize the course so that we start off with stuff we know and we move on to stuff that's more and more speculative and our knowledge is more and more tentative. So when I teach uh, um, uh, this, this full year course, we start with stuff like supply and demand, the theory of comparative advantage, you know, uh, how do firms maximize profits. And we really know that stuff. We economists are pretty sure. We know that you maximize profits by setting marginal revenue equals marginal cost. We're absolutely sure that's right. So I'm, I'm absolutely confident that 100 years from now, economists are going to say, oh, that marginal revenue, marginal cost stuff, we get that wrong. No, I'm sure, I'm sure we've sort of got that one nailed. Then in the spring, we move to macroeconomics, which is the half of the economics we really don't understand as well. But even within macro, I structure the course, we start off with stuff that we're more confident in. Like, you know, why do we, why, why do we have hyperinflation sometimes? Well, we don't, but it's like, why do some countries have hyperinflation? Well, we, under, we understand why Germany in the 1920s had hyperinflation. We understand why Zimbabwe three years ago had hyperinflation. We kind of got that one nailed. We understand that. You print a lot of money, you got hyperinflation. Um, I know Rick Perry's kind of worried about that right now. It's so common, but almost treasonous, Ben Bernanke. I think he, he had this idea that we're going down the route of Zimbabwe. I'm not worried about that particularly. Uh, but, but we understand, that is one thing we really have nailed. So I talk about that in macroeconomics. I think we understand some things about long-run economic growth, but not, not as much as we should. The thing that we understand least as economists, the topic that we're le least sure of is sharp business cycle theory. 
So I do stuff like the Keynesian economics, the fiscal policy multipliers, uh, as the last topic. It's, it is the last month of the course. We do, we do it a lot. It's an important topic. But I do it at the end because it's the stuff where least confident is right. And if you ask me 100 years from now what's going to be different in, in Act 10 from what I'm teaching today, my guess is that's the stuff that's most likely to uh, evolve in some direction. So the Obama administration used a conventional theory, but one that we're not at all is sure is, is right. Now, they have gone on, by the way, to try to measure uh, what the effects of this. There used to be a website called recovery.gov that used to measure how many jobs were created or saved by the stimulus package in each of the 50 states measured to two decimals of accuracy. And uh, if, you, um, if you think about that, try to figure out ex post how, how much effect the stimulus have is very, very hard to do, in part because there are complicated general equilibrium effects that either, either cause multiplier effects or crowding out effects. There's all sorts of reasons on why it's very hard to do. Uh, and, what, and, what they, the, the, and they didn't even try to sort of figure out all these general equilibrium effects. So they did is they just send out surveys to people who received stimulus money and asked them how many jobs were created or saved because you got this check. And there's all sorts of reasons why that can't possibly measure the full macroeconomic effect of, um, uh, uh, of, 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 of government policy. I should have also, but by the way, that even the surveys were a little problem, problematic. Um, uh, my, my favorite story about the recovery.gov uh, data is there was some reporter who was looking through the data and trying to figure out which kind of spending generated the most jobs, according to these surveys. And he found out one firm that had generated jobs at an incredibly low cost. Like, this firm had generated a job for like, every $200 of, spent of stimulus money. So you know, most, most of these estimates were you know, cost 50, 60, $100,000 to get a job. Here's a guy doing it for $200. How did they do it? Well, this, so this reporter went down and tracked down this firm. And it turned out this firm manufactured um, uh, boots for the military. And the, they found the person in the firm who filled up the survey about how many jobs were created or saved. And he said, well, I didn't really know exactly how to answer this question, but I figured for every pair of boots that we sell, some soldier can walk to work. <laughs> and that's how many. So every pair of boots created or saved a, a, a job, because otherwise that poor soldier would be stuck in his bunk. Um, <laughs> that's presumably not what we mean when we study fiscal policy creates or saves jobs, but that's how he interpreted it. So, so I am, um, uh, I'm, skeptical, I'm skeptical of that data. Now there's a debate among economists um, about whether there would have been a better way to stimulate uh, the economy in the uh, short run. Uh, my own, one of my concerns about government spending as a way to stimulate the economy is that it's very hard to spend money uh, quickly and wisely. And uh, I, I, I live in the town of Wellesley, which is west of, of Boston. And my town, over the past several years, has been in the process of building a new high school. And I've been a little bit involved in this, writing, writing some op-eds in favor of it. It's a public works project, um, because I think we really need a new high school. The other one was pretty, pretty old. Uh, but in watching that process, you realize that those things take a long time. It wouldn't be, we didn't want, well, what do you have to do before you build a new high school? Well, first of all, somebody's got to say, you know, I think we need a new high school. Then the town has to debate, do we really need a new high school? Can we, can we afford it? I'll give what the state of the budget is. And then if we really think the high school needs work, do we want to build a new one or do we want to renovate the old one? Uh, where do we want to do this? Do we want a new site? Do we want to find a, an, a, use the old site, find a new site? Uh, what do we want in this new high school? How many science labs versus how many art, um, art rooms? Um, and get it approved by the state, we have to hire architects. We realize that thinking through that process, the amount of discussion you need between when you, somebody first has the idea, oh, high school is kind of old, and you actually break ground and start building a new high school, it's, it's years. Now, of course, I'm sure if you'd gone to high school, uh, the Wellesley and said, look, here's $100 million, I want you to start building a high school now, within three months, I'm sure they could have done it, but you realize they probably wouldn't have done it as well if they didn't take those years thinking through what they really needed. And so my concern about uh, spending is not that we don't need infrastructure. I'm all for infrastructure when we need infrastructure, like I was in favor of the new high school, but I'm apprehensive about using infrastructure spending as a short-run stabilization tool because it's hard to find shovel ready projects. And if you try too hard to find shovel ready projects, you might end up wasting a lot of the money. And President Obama has pretty much acknowledged this where a couple times he said, you know, it's, it's, it was harder to find shovel ready projects than he, uh, than he recognized. Now, 
the, the, the alternative would have been to, instead of doing so much on the spending side, on like an infrastructure spending, to do more on the tax side. And there is a, a literature now debating this question of whether it's better uh, or worse to use taxes versus spending in order to stimulate an economy. And I don't think we really know the answer yet. Interestingly, one of the more important uh, articles in this literature is a work paper by David and Christina Romer. He came on the American Economic Review a couple of years ago. Christina Romer was one of the economic advisors to uh, President Obama. And what the Romers looked at was historical changes in tax policy, try to estimate the size of the tax multiplier, and they found a very large tax multiplier. Their studies uh, found a tax multiplier three times as large as the Obama administration used when they were evaluating alternative fiscal policy options. Now, I don't actually blame the Obama administration for choose, using the other multipliers. They actually used more conventional multipliers. The Romer and Romer multipliers were, really, were much larger than the, the most of the previous literature. But I think the Romer and Romer study does uh, raise some questions as to whether maybe the conventional models leave something out about the impact of taxes uh, on the economy. And there were some other papers, including uh, one by my colleagues, uh, Alberto Alessina and Silvia Ardania, looking at cross-national evidence that suggests that tax policy may be a more potent tool for short-run stabilization than, um, uh, than, than, than spending. Not that we can't, shouldn't spend money, but we should spend money more from the standpoint of long-run cost-benefit analysis rather than from short-run stabiliz stabilization. Um, and I should note, by the way, this is my one, my one ad for Mitt Romney, is that one of Mitt Romney's uh, signature uh, economic policy proposals is to cut the corporate income tax rate from 35 to 25 percent, both as a way to sort of get investment spending going in the short run, but also as a way to sort of promote long run uh, economic growth. Beyond that, I won't say anything else about Mitt Romney policy, but since we're on the question of, of taxes, I should at least, at least mention that in passing. Okay, so that's, well, those are issues about the uh, uh, short run fiscal uh, picture. So, this, all, the, all that short run stuff is always giving us reasons that we should sort of stimulate the economy, run bigger budget deficits, uh, in order to, to get the economy going and prevent us from being Japan. But the more we do that, the more debt we, we accumulate and the uh, bigger problem we face in the long term. That is, the, the more problem we face uh, about turning to Greece. I wrote a, one of my New York Times op-eds um, from, um, I, I don't know, it's been six months ago now. I wrote a hypothetical speech that some future president would give where we, we, the United States, were in the midst of our own fiscal crisis, sort of when we face our own Greece-like situation. So like, it, was, it was written as if it, this was some president giving a speech. And it started off by saying, you know, this, this is a speech from the Oval Office given in uh, 2026. And I got an uh, email from a prominent policy economist uh, who used to be head of the Congressional Budget Office who emailed me saying, no, no, we don't have 15 years to wait. We're going to have a crisis long before that. Um, so I, I, I'm not actually so sure that's right, that, we're, that we're, it's, it's, it's that. Um, uh, with that close uh, to a crisis, but we do face a very, very large uh, imbalance between spending and taxes, uh, not just today, but over the foreseeable future. Um, now, the main reason, there's two, basically two things going on, so let's sort of talk about why we're having this problem, and then talk about the, what the, the solutions um, might be. Um, we're getting older as a society, people are living longer, and we're having fewer children. And the combination of those two things, fewer people coming in at the young ages and more people living at old, at old ages, meaning that society is going to have a higher percentage of the elderly in the future than it has in the past. That's a sort of long-term trend going up. It's being accelerated by the, uh, the when the baby boom generation, basically my generation, retires, uh, which, which, it start, which it is the first baby boomers have started to retire. Uh, but basically, even without the baby boom, it's sort of a long-term trend due to um, changing demographics. So that's one of the problems. And then we have, we've promised lots of benefits to the elderly, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid in particular. And second, the second reason is health care costs are going up. Medicare is obviously health care costs. And not only do we have more elderly drawing on um, the, the, uh, the health care system uh, being paid, paid for by Medicare, but those costs are, are rising over time. Now there's two, there's a lot of points of view about what's driving uh, health care costs up and what can we do to stop health care costs from rising so much. Uh, the, to, to, I'm, I'm going to simplify this a little bit, but the view, the, there's basically two sort of views of how we can sort of fix this problem. Um, there's a view from the left, which is that what we need is some sort of top-down approach. And part of the uh, Affordable Act bill, is something called Obamacare, part of that bill is the creation of something called the Independent Payments Advisory Board, 
which is basically a um, a group of experts that's going to look at the Medicare system, what it pays for, and to look at certain things that they're doing wrong, that are that they thought cost effective, and we should, should stop paying for those things. Um, no, I, when, an expert on this was sort of telling me that there's some, I, don't, I forget the, the, what the medical details are, but there's some procedure that Medicare now pays for they, that costs $100,000 that on average lengthens somebody's life by three or four months. And that's, and that's, so, so that, they, it's very possible that the Independent Payments Advisory Board may look at that and say, I'm sorry. That, that doesn't pass the cost, cost, cost benefit uh, test. It's too, it's too expensive. So that's sort of a top down approach. Uh, people on the right don't like that. They call it death panel. Uh, and what they favor is competition. Uh, sort of, I think it's a bottom up approach to basically give people something like vouchers or giving people a certain sum of money that they can then use to buy on competing private plans and, um, and the competition on private plans and free choice among those private plans will keep costs uh, uh, down. Um, so I think those are, those are the two approaches that are sort of out there politically. I, I'm not a particularly a subscriber to either one. I'm sort of a pessimist on this issue. I'm, I'm generally an optimistic person, by the way. But on, on, on health care costs and whether our ability to contain health care costs, I am um, skeptical because I uh, think the main driver of increasing health care costs uh, over time is changes in technology. And changes in technology are finding newer and better ways to prolong and enhance life, but those ways are expensive. For sure, there's inefficiencies, and we can get rid of some of those inefficiencies through various mechanisms. But the primary driver of increasing costs over time is technology. And it's, not, it's technology that we shouldn't despair about. We should actually be delighted that it's there, because it does uh, improve the quality of our lives, but we should recognize that it's expensive. And it will become increasingly difficult to figure out how to allocate that as a society. Let me give you another example that I like to give to students. I, imagine we invented the following healthcare technology. I'm going to call it the Dorian Gray pill. For those of you who have read the Oscar Wilde novel. Remember Dorian Gray had this, had this uh, portrait that allowed him, he, Dorian Gray, and then we get old, this portrait aged for him. Well, it's Dorian Gray pills like that, too. You take a Dorian Gray pill once a day, and you will uh, not get sick, you will not die, you will not even age. It's perfect healthcare technology, okay? The problem is, it's a very expensive pill. It costs $100,000 a year to manufacture your supply. Let's imagine we invented that technology. What, how do you feel about that? Well, first of all, Bill Gates and many other people could pay $100,000 a year and live forever. On the other hand, we couldn't give everybody the Dorian Gray technology because the pill costs $100,000 a year to provide to a person. The average income in the United States is only forty dollars to $50,000. So we, we just, we should, we're not financially capable of giving everyone the Dorian Gray pill. So if that darn great technology were available, what would Medicare say? Would Medicare provide any to anybody? Would they let Bill Gates buy some on his own and live forever? Would, they, would the society view that as too inequitable? Now the reason I, I bring up that hypothetical is not because I think we're on the verge of it, but because we, that is the direction that we are slowly moving toward. <laughs> Medical technology is getting better and better. We're living longer and longer and healthier and healthier, but it's getting more and more expensive. And the Dorian Gray pill is just the extreme case of that. And, the Dor and thinking about the, the Dorian Gray hypothetical makes you realize that that will force society to confront some very, very difficult questions. How much inequality in healthcare outcomes are we going to allow? Because at some point, we will find we can't provide top-notch healthcare to everybody because it gets too expensive. And then what, how are we going to allocate that as a society? To what extent are we going to allow freedom of choice? To what extent are we going to enforce more egalitarian values? I don't think that's, there's any uh, easy um, uh, answers to that. Now, so, so what's the solution to uh, this long-term fiscal problem that's, that's getting uh, worse over time due to demographics and, and increasing health care costs? Well, when President Obama came in, he proposed a budget. And it was, I was very, um, it was kind of a discouraging budget. Uh, let me tell you exactly what, what, what it, if those of you don't know what presidential budgeting works like, when the president proposes a budget, it's not a forecast of what he thinks will happen. It's a proposal of what he thinks should happen. So basically, the president puts all of his proposals in there, assumes they all pass, and then projects forward the budget over the next 10 years, assuming everything he wants gets through Congress. And if you look at the president's first budget, what it basically said was, OK, if I get everything I, I proposed, the, the ratio of debt to GDP is going to rise forever. 
which is, of course, not sustainable. You can't have your debt-to-income ratio rise in, in perpetuity forever. Eventually, people say, oh, I'm sorry, you can't borrow anymore. So basically, he knew that even, even if everything he proposed got enacted, which, of course, never happens to any president, but even if everything he knew got enacted, he still would be, would be heading towards a fiscal crisis. And he knew that, and that's why he proposed a, a fiscal commission um, and, uh, headed by um, Erskine Bowles and uh, former Senator Ellen Simpson. Now, I, I was a little suspicious that the presidential commissions would, would turn out uh, anything exciting because uh, they usually don't. Um, but this one actually turned out, to my surprise, to actually be an extremely effective commission. Effective in terms of coming up a document that had a lot of proposals that, to me, as an economist, made a lot of sense. Uh, now, a lot of these things are not politically popular, but from an economics standpoint, they make a lot of sense. So, for example, they wanted to uh, change some of the rules for Social Security. Uh, they, want, uh, they wanted to raise the, re re the normal retirement age for Social Security. Uh, they wanted to change the indexation rules to sort of lower benefits, especially for the higher income uh, recipients. They wanted to, to reform the tax system in a way that raises revenue but without raising tax rates. Uh, and that is what economists who study tax reform, that is sort of the mantra. You know, lower rates broaden the base. And that is precisely what Bowles and Simpson uh, did, is proposed ways to lower the rates and broaden the base. Now, so all that made sense, but it's politically very difficult. Why is that? Well, the way you um, uh, 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 lower uh, the rates and broaden the base is you've got to get rid of lots of deductions. A lot of these deductions and exclusions are things that are quite popular politically, even if economists will tell you they don't make a lot of sense. So let me just give you one example, the mortgage interest deduction. The mortgage interest deduction basically encourages people to, it's not basically subsidizes home ownership. Um, well, is that, is, well, how, do, how does an economist think about that? Well, you can think about it from the standpoint of economic efficiency, which is, you know, are we allocating this, this scarce supply of capital we have in the most efficient way? Well, it turns out we're taxing corporate capital at a much higher rate than we are residential capital, which we're subsidizing. And as a result, too much of the capital stock we have ends up in, the, in housing. So from an economic efficiency standpoint, the mortgage interest deduction would make much sense. But from the standpoint of egalitarian values, of well, worrying about the poor, does it make sense there? Well, not really, because the poor tend not to own their own homes. The poor tend to be more renters. And if you're subsidizing home ownership, who's bearing the burden of that? Well, it's going to be the renters. There's no free lunch here. So if somebody's getting subsidized, somebody else is paying the bill. And so you're having a policy where renters who tend to be poorer are subsidizing homeowners who tend to be richer. So this, not only, this policy not only doesn't have efficiency arguments for it, doesn't seem to have even egalitarian arguments for it. So whether you're worried about egalitarian principles or efficiency principles, it doesn't seem to be a particularly good policy. Despite the fact it's politically quite popular policy because homeowners like getting a subsidy homeowners vote, and it's a, it's a rare politician who's going to pound the table in order to get the uh, uh, mortgage interest deduction uh, eliminated. So that's sort of, sort of one um, um, example uh, of something they proposed that was politically um, uh, unpopular, but I think made a lot of sense. Another thing that they proposed that makes a lot of sense that's not politically popular is raising the gasoline tax. They proposed raising it by only 15 cents a gallon. When I look at all of the negative externalities, that is the adverse side effects associated with gasoline consumption, and I try to figure out what the optimal tax looks like. I, I'd raise the gasoline tax by $2 a gallon. Um, this is why you say, it's why Mitt Romney said, I don't agree with everything he says. Um, uh, but, so I think a lot of economists who would agree with that, who would agree with us, we need sizable increases in gasoline taxes, but relatively few politicians, mainly because relatively few voters think it's a good idea, despite what the economics might look like. Now, what will we see going forward? Um, I think one of the big questions is um, to what extent are we going to adjust on the spending side and to what extent are we adjust on the tax side? So if, uh, if something's going to happen. Either we're going to get very big decreases in the social safety net, which I mean Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and the new Affordable Care Act that was just passed. Either major decreases in spending on those uh, or major tax increases or some combination of the two. There's really no way uh, around uh, that. And the big political debate for the next generation is going to be, which of those two is it going to be? The fact that it's got to be one of those two is, is without doubt. And it, the second sort of question is, if we do it on the tax side, which taxes is, is it going to be? If we're going to, now I, I, I am personally a believer, a believer in smaller government. I'd rather do more on the spending side. But it's a, that's a political and values judgment as well as it is an economic judgment. Uh, but if we're going to do the tax side, then the question is, which taxes are we going to raise? If we're going to raise taxes, a tax that has a lot of virtue from an economic standpoint, 
but it raises a lot of thorny political issues, is what's called the value-added tax of VAT. A lot of European countries have it. Um, what a value-added tax is, it's basically a retail sales tax that's collected along the chain of production rather than all at the final uh, sale. Um, and you saw, it's funny, um, Herman Cain doesn't say he's got a value-added tax, but this retail sales tax is the functional equivalent of a value-added a value, uh, tax. And so you, you see, uh, a lot, I think you'll see a lot of debate over if we, to the extent we need, need more tax revenue as to whether the value-added tax is the way to do it. Um, uh, it tends to be a, uh, value-added tax probably tends to be something that conservatives are, are, are wary about because they look at Europe and they say, my gosh, look at Europe, they have a huge government, they have a value-added tax. If we have a value-added tax, it would be too easy for future Congresses to raise it. This is just, this is a, uh, a way for us to become France. Uh, so that's what conservatives are worried about. Another way to think of looking over at Europe, saying, look, Europe has decided to have a big government. They've decided to have a robust social safety net. Given they've made that decision as a value, as a political matter, they have to fund it in some relatively efficient way. They couldn't just use the kind of tax system we have and raise 40% uh, of, of, of GDP in tax revenue. So they turned to a more efficient tax, which is the value added tax. And this sort of great raises me to the, to the last sort of question that I want to sort of just put, put in your mind, which is, What's the difference between the U.S. and France, besides the food? Um, what we know about France and many other continental Europeans, this is, this is uncontrovertible, is they work less, fewer hours over their lifetimes than Americans do. They retire earlier, they have shorter work weeks, they have more holidays, they just spend less time at work. As a result, not surprisingly, incomes are lower there. GDP is roughly 30% lower in France. GDP per person is roughly 30% lower in France than it is here. <coughs> Now, that, that, those two facts are basically uncont uncontroversial among economists. What is more controversial is why. Why do the French work less? Is it a certain joie de vivre that we don't have? Um, or is it something else? Uh, the economist Ed Prescott, a Nobel Prize winner from the University of Minnesota, has said the reason the French work less than we do, and the Italians as well, is that they have higher taxes. Now, some other people say that's not right. It's differences in tastes. It's, it's the difference in the role of unions. So there's, there's a debate among economists as to why it is that Americans work so much more than many Europeans do. Now, if we do go down this route of putting in a sizable value-added tax and having a size large, if we basically preserve the social safety that we have to we're now pay for it with higher taxes, which is, of course, one political choice we might make, um, then we're, this is great news for Ed Prescott because we'll be able to test this hypothesis. So basically, the question is whether the next generation of Americans, that is my uh, children and grandchildren, uh, whether they'll spend more time uh, sitting in a uh, cafe sipping espresso and less time uh, at work, nose to the grindstone. So that's sort of the big sort of hypothesis that would maybe in the next generation, economic hypothesis that we can test. And you know, th 30 years from now, I can come back and we can see, see uh, how, how it turned out. So let me sort of stop there. And um, I'm happy to take questions on uh, anything I've said or things I didn't say that might be in your mind. Um, and I've, I've been asked to request that the audience gives first preference to student questions. Because um, after all, their parents are paying for tuition. Um, uh, so, 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 so please. This, this, this microphone's up here. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Matthew. Yes, Tom. Okay, cool. Uh, my question is about Herman Cain's 999 plan. And I think the 9% sales tax scares me more than it seems to uh, scare other presidential candidates, and that's primarily because um, eco Econ 101. Um, I believe prices are sticky, um, and even on top of that, that a 9% sales tax um, will reduce consumption while it might raise uh, exports and investment. And as someone from Los Angeles County, we already pay 9.75% sales tax. It would be that much uh, bigger. So besides the fact that the media might want Herman Cain to win because they think he's an easier um, opponent against Obama. Why do you think uh, <laughs> the, the focus of this plan is so much on the apples and oranges rather than um, the terrible effects it could have on the economy? Well, well I'm, this, this, you, you, the one argument made is about sticky prices, and, and that's sort of a short run phenomenon. I'm sure, I'm sure if there's any tax reform, it's, it's, gonna take, it's not going to happen immediately. It's going to take. It's going to phase in. Um, so I, I, I'm, I think the, the right to frame the question is: What kind of tax system do we want in the long run? 
Um, and the, the, so I start thinking from Lawrence's perspective. What the 999, as I understand, is basically a flat tax, uh, a, a proportional tax. Um, I, I, I think taxing consumption is actually not a bad idea. And in fact, what, the, the income tax we have, I think if you actually think of the tax system we have, it has been slowly been morphing from an income tax base to a consumption tax base. So you know, we have something that we call an income tax. But then we have these things like IRAs, Kehoe plans, SEP IRAs, Roth IRAs, 401k plans, which provide all sorts of ways people take their saving and put it in tax preferred vehicle. And to the extent that people do that, what, the, what are they left being taxed in the tax of the consumption? So you know, if, the typical, if you're the typical worker doing most of your saving to your 401k plan, then essentially you're being taxed in your consumption because everything that's going to your 401k plan is being deducted before your taxes are being born. So your income tax liability is really a consumption tax liability. <coughs> So I don't think thinking about a consumption tax as the base of taxation um, is, is, a, is a bad idea. Uh, I think that the more difficult question is the uh, distributional effects of that. If we, had a, if we took all the tax code right now and replaced it with a flat proportional tax, it would, it would mean substantial tax increases for middle and low income people. Because a lot of low income people uh, pay, pay much lower rates of tax, uh, income taxation. They can benefit from things like the earned income tax credit which is a subsidy administered through the income tax uh, system. Uh, now, you could combine a flat tax with a demo grant, and that's an, an issue that Milton Friedman proposed a long, long time ago, and actually George McGovern proposed it, not very successfully as when he was a presidential candidate. And the idea being we have a flat system, everybody pays the same rate, but then we give a lump sum demo grant to everybody so that people go towards the bottom on net are beneficiaries, not, 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 not taxpayers. So the average tax rate can be very progressive, even if the marginal tax rates are flat. And that's not a bad idea. Now, if, you, if you actually want to read more about that, two places to go. One is there's a chapter in Milton Friedman's book, Capitalism and Freedom. But if you want to read a lot about it, go and read a wonderful book by uh, Robert Paul and Alvin Rushka, who were one of the first proponents of, of the flat tax. <coughs> yes, sir. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, uh, I was very curious to, uh, when you talked about the doctrine analogy, um, whether the dish should be bigger or not. With the deficit being 100% of GDP, or roughly 100% of GDP currently, how big right. of a stimulus do you think the, for, like the future deficit can sustain? Well, that's a good question. Now, how high can debt go before the bond market says, we don't trust you anymore? Right. Um, uh, the bond market has, is, right, is right now willing to lend money to the United States at very low rates of interest. So the bond market is saying, we're not worried. On the other hand, if you look at interest rates four years ago at Greece, the bond market was not worried. So the bond market can change its mind quite quickly. The reason why I think the bond market's not worried, it, it goes back to this old, uh, this old quip from Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill once said, Americans can always be counted on doing the right thing after exhausting all the alternatives. <laughs> and right now, in the, well, the past few years, we've been in the process of exhausting all the alternatives on, on the longer fiscal situation. I mean, really the past 20 years, probably. Um, and, but the bond market still thinks we'll eventually do the right thing. Uh, and I think actually the bond market's probably right. I, I have enough faith in American institutions to think we will eventually do the right thing. But it will be a, a lot of political debate, and, and, and there's going to be disagreement as to what, you know, to what extent are we doing on the spending side, to what extent are we going to do it on the tax side. Um, uh, so, I, I, so I do think eventually uh, we're going to have to deal with these issues. But the bond market right now is pretty, um, pretty sanguine. Oh, yes, we could. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Thank you. My high school economics teacher is very jealous right now. <laughs> uh, my question is, um, in this summer, uh, we had the debt crisis showdown, and I guess the, the agreement they came out was that we would have um, spending cuts with no increase in revenue, tax revenue. And my question is, um, was that the best decision to have spending cuts without any substantial increases in revenue? And uh, I mean, you know, if, if, there are, if the conservatives weren't so adhered to their ideology, um, you know, bipartisan, would it be better to have revenues um, to um, accommodate the spending You know, I think the sense to which we do it on the spending side and which, to what extent do we do it on the tax side is, goes beyond economics. I think it goes well beyond economics. I think it goes to really fundamental values as to how, what role we believe the state should play in, in a society. To what, how robust do you have the social safety net? Um, and, um, uh, it, and, and how, much ta how, how taxes want to be. I mean, in some sense, I mean, if you could design a society from scratch, well, you might, what I could imagine doing is going to get back to the earlier question about flat tax. You could say, I'm going to have a flat tax on all consumption, and then I'm going to give everybody, I'm going to use some of the tax revenue to give a demigrant to, to, every, to everybody. And obviously, the bigger the demigrant is going to be, the higher the tax is going to have to be, because I'm going to fund the demigrant. 
But obviously, the bigger the demogram, the more the social safety net is going to be, because the, the more you're going to give to somebody who has pure nothing. And what we can do as a society is we can say, okay, we're going to vote on this. We're going to have the way we, I, I'm sure some of you here study the median voter theorem, and one of the famous Robert Anthony Downs results that democracies tend toward the preferences of the median voter. Well, if you really want to do this in a Downsian kind of way, we say, okay, everybody in society walks into the voting booth, they say, I think a demogram should be this. I think everybody should get $1,000 a month, $1,500 a month, $2,000 a month. Knowing that the, the more, larger the number is, the more taxes everybody's going to pay, we then put all our numbers into the, into the hat. Someone takes, starts sorting, takes sorting them out, and then we choose the median one, and that's the outcome of the society. Because in some sense, we're all faced the question of to what extent do we want to be a compassionate society, or to what extent do we want to be a society in which people rely, rely on their, have the freedom to, to, to lead their own lives without the burden of taxation. No, I don't think anybody says, although very few people, Americans would say, the poor, I don't care, no social safety net at all. And really the question is how big it's going to be. We haven't really come up, come up with a great way to frame it. But if we were starting from scratch, we could sort of frame it this is one parameter. Here's the demigrant, and realize we're going to have to fund it to all together, and let's sort of figure, figure out what the median person wants to do. Uh, that's, you know, so that would be my thought experiment for a, a hypothetical society. And, the, and, and what, we're, what our political institutions do is try to, in a very imperfect way, grapple with that question to try to come up with some sort of consensus answer in a democracy, which is not easy. Now, the, the, I, I, and a lot of people, I remember I was at a talk recently, with, uh, I was at, on a panel with Robert Solow, the really great economist, the Nobel Prize winner, and he, he talked about the debt debate. Uh, he, he, Robert said, Rob said that, you know, calling the United States a banana republic is just an insult to South America. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I have to admit, I have a much more sanguine view about American institutions. Sure, it's, it's really ugly to watch, and it's really hard to get anything done. But remember, it's hard to get anything done for a good reason. We have a society, a government system, with lots of checks and balances. Our founding fathers didn't want a government that could get stuff easily done. They distrusted democracy, fundamentally. They didn't think the, the, the majority should always get its way, because they didn't think democratic democracy necessarily worked, an idea that Ken Arrow actually kind of, sort of solidified as Arrow's possibility theory many years later. So democracy is an imperfect institution, and the founding fathers said, well, look, we want checks and balances in order to make, to sort of put, throw some sands in the wheels of democratic forces. They did that for good reason. I think that, that was generally a wise thing uh, to do, but as you see sort of Washington being dysfunctional, you should say, okay, that was part of what the founding fathers had in mind. They wanted a little bit of dysfunction. Maybe not quite as much as we have, but they wanted a little bit of this function. They didn't want things to be too easy uh, for in democracies. Yeah, um, I'm curious uh, where you come down on the question of whether what we need to simulate right now is demand or stimulate uh, investment in a more supply side sort of way. Um, you mentioned cutting, I think it was the corporate income tax, right. um, and it seems like that's that's a way to simulate investment only insofar as you you don't think investment's waiting on demand. So I'm, I'm wondering where, where you where you fall on that. Yeah, and so. I, when I went to uh, work, work, work for George Bush, I, uh, I got a, there were some, several editorials attacking my, my choice as, a, as an economist because uh, they thought I was too Keynesian. Uh, and some of the uh, supply-siders um, uh, didn't think I, 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 I appreciated the, the incentive effects of taxes enough. I think they uh, changed their mind as they, as they saw me in action. But um, I, I, I have a, a lot of my academic work is what's called New Keynesian Economics. And, I do believe there's an important role for aggregate demand in the short run uh, business cycle. In terms of the corporate tax cut, I think of the corporate tax cut as working on both supply and demand. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a supply side economist or demand side economist, I'm a supply and demand economist. Um, so I really think we need to think about both sides of that. And I think about corporate tax uh, cut as being aimed at, one, moving the tax code in directions more pro-growth in the long run, but also to the extent it increases investment in the short run that should promote aggregate demand. Because ag investment is the most com volatile complement of aggregate demand. Um, and to say we can incentivize people to start spending again, that would be, on uh, investment goods, that would be one way to increase aggregate demand. I actually have a, if you actually want to know my views most fully on this, I have a paper published in Brookings, just came out a few months ago, called Opt uh, Explorations and Optimal Stabilization Policy. But that's a completely a demand side story, but, but then it concludes that investment subsidies may be the best way to actually get demand up in, in the midst of a, uh, but I'm a small point we face today. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Mankiw. Uh, my question has to do with the capital gains tax. 
Uh, there's debate now as to whether the tax should be lowered. And uh, from an equity, equity point of view, I imagine there could be uh, progressive implications to this, but I'm interested in what you think the economic efficiency implications would be of a lower capital gains tax. And Professor Blinder has suggested that lower capital gains taxes create certain economic distortions. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that or if you have a different opinion. If I were to start a tax code from scratch, um, I would tax basically consumption. I would think of consumption as the basis for, for taxation. And then any kind of capital income, uh, whether it's capital gains or dividends, wouldn't be taxed until somebody turned around and spent it on a consumption good. So as long as you're just earning income but not spending it. Uh, so basically, basically it's, it, it is a long tradition going back uh, many centuries uh, where people have suggested consumption taxes rather than income taxes uh, as the basis for, for taxation. Uh, and that's sort of the framework I, I come to. So, I, so with, that, with that basic framework in mind, I'm, I can be in favor of expanding things that move the income tax toward a consumption tax. So things like IRAs and Roth IRAs, I would expand those. And to the extent that's the case, so you put your, 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 your wealth in a Roth IRA or a, uh, or, or a regular IRA, you don't pay tax on it until you take it out and spend it and consume it. And then, then you basically exempt capital gains. No. Now, we are, the, you're, the, you're asking us a more, more, more difficult um, question, which is given that we have an imperfect tax system now, with all sorts of distortions, would a lower capital gains rate move in a good direction or a bad direction? And that's, that's a much, much harder question. There's no question that capital gains is a very distortionary tax in lots of ways. On the other hand, if, it's, if that tax rate is much lower than a lot of other forms of income taxes, then there's all sorts of incentives for people to sort of change regular kind of income into capital gains income. So I appreciate what Alan's talking about, but I think by itself it's too narrow, too narrow a question. So I'd really like to sort of broach that kind of question in the context of more, more comprehensive tax reform. Thank you. Any other questions? I think some of the non-students can come up now. You would be very nice to defer. Any other questions? Well, if there are no other questions, let me thank you very much. And I'll stay around for a few minutes.